from the beginning. Okay, so we are recording now. So welcome everybody. Um, this is the first in a series of webinar dialogues that ARP will be hosting over the coming weeks and months to discuss how recreation parks will be adapting to the COVID crisis and planning for the recovery phase once we're into that phase as well. We'll be recording the webinar today, as mentioned, so that we can share conversations and resources with others that couldn't be on the call today. I know there was some demand even outside of Alberta for jumping on the call so we can share with our CPRA partners. Uh, I'm Steve Allen, I'm the Executive Director with ARPA and I'll be acting as our moderator with our panelists today. Um, if you're in the wrong webinar, I just wanted to let you know this one is about park operations, the impacts and changes to park operations. So. I first want to start by acknowledging um, the First Nations, the Métis, and all the people across Alberta who share a history and a deep connection with this land. We dedicate ourselves to uh, moving forward in partnership with our Indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Uh, just a bit of background on Alberta Recreation and Parks Association. So we're a provincial charitable not-for-profit organization that's committed to building healthier and happier communities and citizens by developing and promoting recreation and parks. We have over uh, almost 2,000 members from across the province. The majority of those are municipalities in the province, but we have a lot of NGOs, businesses, uh, students, post-secondaries as members as well. We're also a member of the Canadian Parks and Recreation Association, which is a national organization and it's dedicated to realizing the full potential of parks and recreation as a major contributor to uh, community health and vibrancy. So as mentioned, uh, with the high number um, of people on today's call, I saw it was approaching 80 there. Um, we're gonna run today's call as more of a webinar style than a dialogue. We are gonna do some more dialogue stuff later. Uh, Barb Peterson, um, one of our members has volunteered to help out facilitate some of those dialogues. So we might, we're gonna try to figure out a process for those. We might do them regionally and uh, have them more conversation based and sharing based so that we can learn and share from each other. But today we'll, we'll probably be mostly learning and sharing from our, our panelists today. Um, so we do have a panel of four ARPA members from municipalities across Alberta and they'll provide information on what each of their respective organizations has or will be doing to adapt to the COVID crisis um, in, their, in their communities, specifically in re relation to park operations. After the call, we'll also share some resources that will help you plan and make future decisions. Um, one example of this is Trevor Poth from the City of Red Deer started a table of comparisons on operations today with uh, the panel members and we'll look to populate that out a bit and share it. I have uh, Patrick McQuarrie from ARPA on the call today. Thanks for joining Patrick and he's our webinar expert. Um, so he's going to provide a quick overview of the Zoom platform and some of the features that might assist you in having a quality experience today, kind of go over how we're going to moderate Q&A. Um, so I'll turn it over to you quickly, Patrick, before we get into other stuff. Sure. Um, so the Zoom platform looks a little bit different depending on how you're watching the webinar today, whether you're watching it on a phone or a tablet or a Mac or a desktop or anything like that. So um, the sort of key features that you should have in the attendee is you should have a chat function at the bottom, which is just sort of the general chat. You can see I've been trying to sort out uh, Captain's audio issues in the chat right now. Um, there's also uh, the ability to raise your hand, which I see that who has figured this out already, Doug has already figured out how to raise his hand. So I see your hand, Doug. And if you have a question, uh, the way we're gonna be sort of asked our panelists today is there should be a Q&A pod at the bottom of the screen. So if you click on that as an attendee, you should be able to enter any questions that you have. And then all of our panelists should be able to open that as well. And if they're not presenting, they might be able to answer it by uh, uh, just responding with a comment or something like that, or they can address it during their presentation. But those are the, the three main features that we're gonna be using. As a participant, you don't have the ability to unmute yourself or use your own camera. Um, if for some reason we want to change that, um, I would have to promote you to a panelist. So you don't have any of those uh, audio or video features right now. All right, perfect. Thanks, Patrick. Um, so today's panelists include um, Dave Ellis from the City of Lethbridge, and he's also an ARPA board member with us. Uh, Trevor Poth is with the City of Red Deer, and he's also the chair of CPRA's Parks Task Group. We have Travis Kennedy from the City of Edmonton, and we have Catherine Stotzcheck 
from the city of Calgary. We're gonna keep the discussions pretty topic based. So I have a list of topics. Thank you for submitting your topics online. We're gonna to try to get through as many as we can. I mentioned to the panelists, I'm, I'd like to probably line up another one of these in a couple of weeks, if we, especially if we don't get through all of the topics. I, I think some of the topics may change and, and new ones may emerge that we need to talk about in a couple of weeks time anyway. So we'll look to do another one of these um, in, in, in due time. So today we have 60 minutes to schedule. Um, and just to start things off, we did want to try a couple polls. Um, before we get to the polls, Patrick, I'm just gonna, sorry, we're, we're all learning the new software. I'm gonna try sharing my screen. Um, and I'm gonna bring up, um, here, so NRPA did a, a quick survey with their, um, constituents in terms of, of uh, park operations and how it's how it's being affected but uh, some of the um, the data out of it 92% um, are keeping their trail networks open um, and a slim majority of them uh, are, are keeping open their dog parks 58% and their community gardens at 68% uh, 75% are keeping all of their park spaces open um, 71% had closed their playgrounds by the time this survey was done. 68% had closed their washrooms and outdoor amenities. 51% um, were locking gates to pre-existing fencing. And 30% were wrapping equipment with yellow tape. Um, and then in terms of staffing and other things, so 45% had implemented hiring freezes. Uh, 40% were deferring capital projects. So just some interesting data that, that's come out of that. Um, and how do I stop sharing my screen, Patrick? Right at the top of the screen. There should be oh, yeah. Data. Perfect. I see it. Yeah, thanks. So I just wanted to, to sh share that real quickly. Um, so Patrick's got a couple of polls, similar polls that we've lined up. So if you're joining by the computer today, you'll, you should be able to see these polls and, and we should be able to to get some quick data from them. So Patrick, I might turn you over for question one. Are you, are you able to see this poll? I am not, but uh, if you want to troubleshoot it, we can come back to them later. Okay, give me one more, give me one more shot. Oh, now I can. Yeah. So hopefully everybody can see question one on their screen. Um, hopefully it's working for the majority of folks. So it says, which of the following amenities has closed at your agency municipality in response to COVID-19? Check all that apply. And then there's a list of, of, uh, of choices you can make. Playgrounds, outdoor amenities, so picnic tables, picnic sites, park benches, Washrooms is a separate one, sports fields, trails, parks, and none at this time. So um, host and panelists cannot vote. So sorry, Trevor and Dave and Travis and Catherine, I guess you're not able to vote, but hopefully everybody out there is uh, able to, to log something and we'll kind of see what the quick results are once people have had a chance. Do you see the numbers going up on your end, Patrick? I sure do. Okay, great. If you show it to us, is it, does it change live? I have to stop, I have to close the poll before I can show the results, so. Okay. Wait until the numbers start. Sounds good. Hope oh, everyone should be able to see. Are you seeing the results now? Uh, not yet. I'm still seeing the poll question, but. Okay, there we go. All right, so um, thanks for that. Thanks, Patrick. So 90% have closed their playgrounds, 28% uh, their outdoor amenities, 57% their washrooms, 39% sports fields closed, 
only 3% have closed summer, summer all of their trail systems, 11% have closed some parks, and 5% have closed nothing at this time. So just some quick data on, on uh, what's going on in the province. So um, thanks, Patrick. Could you put up question two? Okay, question two. Uh, not yet, but there was a delay for the other ones, so maybe similar delay. Oh, there it is. Question two, which of the following steps, if any, has your agency taken to reduce expenses? Um, again, so I think you can choose more than one of these, right, Patrick? Yep. Hopefully, yep. So adjusting your service levels, hiring freezes, deferring or canceling your capital projects, ramping down, uh, deferring your ongoing maintenance, laying off or reducing your staff hours, uh, reducing the use of outside contractors, and my agency has not taken any steps to reduce expenses. So we'll just let that run for a little bit. Patrick, were, were we able to sort out Catherine's audio or is she just a participant now? Uh, I haven't, she dropped, I gave her a link to try to log back in to, to try to reset it, but I haven't seen her log back in yet. I'm still okay. the participants now saying if she's down here. Yeah, I just wanted to know just as we roll into things here. All right, hold on, I'll close this poll. Okay. All right, so, so here's the poll results. So 65% of uh, you out there have adjusted your service levels and uh, hiring freezes as well. So that's a popular one that people have instituted. Uh, looking to defer and cancel capital projects is 43%. Ramping down and deferring ongoing maintenance at 43%. Um, layoffs and reduced staff, staffing hours at 58%. Uh, reducing the use of outside contractors at 23% and only 10% so far have not taken any steps to reduce expenses. So a lot of people have already started to instigate change and adapt to, uh, to the new, the new uh, way of doing business, I guess we would call it. So um, thank you for that, Patrick. So that was just a couple of quick questions at the beginning. So now I'd like to get into um, our panel discussions. Uh, so how this will work, uh, especially for the panelists, I guess, is I'll just, uh, I'll introduce a topic and I'll pick one of you to start the conversations and just kind of talk about what your organization has done in, in specific to that topic. And then we'll let the other panelists join in if there's uh, some other things that they would have to say. And then we'll move on to the next topic. I've kind of ordered them, I think, in terms of priorities that I, I saw out there. I'm hoping we can get to a lot of them, but uh, you know we only have 40 minutes left, so there may be some that we don't get to, and, and we'll look to do that in a, in a follow-up webinar. So just in terms of uh, playground and park amenity closures, so some of the questions came in, what should be closed now, and how are we physically closing them? What about outdoor fitness equipment? What about skate parks? Um, are, those, are those considered playground equipment? So. Uh, maybe I will start off with Dave on this one. We uh, uh, closed our playgrounds pretty quickly a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the playgrounds are closed. The public washrooms are closed. The playgrounds include all of our fitness equipment. And they also closed the skate park because we just don't have the capability of uh, limiting the number of users there. So those things have been closed for a little bit. We decided not to use tape. Uh, we just put up signs, basically zap strap signs onto the playgrounds and uh, taped onto the washrooms, just basically saying they were closed, don't use them. Our bylaw enforcement officers and animal control officers are doing patrols around the parks, just helping people remember and uh, stay off of them. They're okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Trevor, anything to add to, to what Dave said? 
Uh, so the only thing, uh, we're in a very similar situation. We have used flagging tape to actually tie off the playgrounds themselves, uh, just to visually allow the kids to uh, not expose themselves to different touch points through the park. The other big thing that we've done is we've actually fenced off or we're in the process of fencing off our state parks themselves. Uh, putting up signs uh, really wouldn't be effective for us, we didn't think. So we've actually physically closed those. All the rest of our amenities, we've either just locked the doors or installed signs. So we've done flagging tape only for playgrounds and physically only closed our state parks and washrooms. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, Travis? Yeah, much, much the same as the other folks. Um, in addition, though, we did put uh, pretty comprehensive signage across our playground network. Um, and we have included kind of our adult fitness uh, areas for, it, under the closure as well. Um, everything's flag taped uh, with signage. Okay, thanks, Travis. Catherine, I uh, hope you're able to join us now. I don't know if you are. I still don't think she has okay. audio. No, yeah, no worries. That's good. So Catherine, consider yourself a participant now. So uh, you're welcome to sit back and, and uh, listen in and, and uh, thanks for, for joining today. So another one, and I know uh, Dave sent some stuff to the board on this one uh, early on that, that was useful for some of our positioning. We did send, uh, ARPA did send a statement out on parks today, just supportive of keeping them open wherever possible. Um, so physical distancing protocols, parks and trails, um, what about staff and users? What about tight and busy entry points, signage, enforcement, all the things? So uh, this one, I guess this topic will call uh, trail systems and uh, implementing physical distancing protocols properly. So uh, I, I hate to start with Dave again first, but he had a lot of good stuff, I think, going on down in Lethbridge. So I'll start with Dave again and then I'll mix it up after this. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, so we're experiencing much higher than normal use of our parks as people are getting stressed and anxious at home. They're getting outside more. I mean, it, our, our snow is gone, so we're maybe a, a little bit ahead of other folks, but uh, our, our parks are busier than normal. And in order to facilitate that and help people use the park safely, we have um, put up a number of signs. So we just had them made up. They, they look basically like like that, we, we chose to um, continue with social distancing because when we, um, when we did this, physical distancing hadn't really become a, a thing yet. And our communications folks tell us that if we start changing things midstream, we kind of lose impact as people figure, figure the semantics out. So we, we stayed with social distancing on our parks. Uh, probably the most important message on there is that if the park is too busy to allow for proper social distancing, then uh, you should go somewhere else. And we made a plug for our parks and pathways app. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, we'll go to Travis this time next. Sorry to put you on there, Travis, but anything yeah, you need so to our, do with trails. Yeah, so our trail system remains uh, open for use. Um, we've done a lot of work in terms of closures of uh, staircases. Uh, and we've done a lot of uh, kind of social media and education, um, but also we've increased our presence of peace officers or River Valley Rangers to make sure that um, they're at the front end of offering education and uh, enforcement if need be. Okay, thanks, Travis. And I did see that Catherine is putting some comments into the, the comment bar in terms of what Calgary's doing. So thank you, Catherine, for that. Uh, Trevor, in terms of your trail systems. So we've uh, kept our trails open up till this point in time. Uh, the area probably that's most controversial is our off-leash areas because uh, as Dave identified, use especially in our off-leash areas has probably tripled from what would be a seasonal norm. Um, so in those cases, we've uh, actually removed all the gates from our off-leash areas to minimize touch points to just stop people from having to manually open gates to get in. And we've installed a pile of social distancing signs. I think that we were uh, last count at 600 signs and we're anticipating adding another five to 600 in the next two weeks. Okay, thanks Trevor. Um, so uh, kind of a good segue and I'm gonna let uh, Travis start on this one because I live in the city and uh, I know what you guys have done with dog parks. So, so what have you guys done with your dog parks? Yeah, okay. So uh, there's two types of dog parks in the cities. One's surrounded by um, fences. Well, there's three types, on-leash, off-leash, and then our fenced off-leash. So where we have perimeter fences around our off-leash areas, gated entryways, we've actually closed those and locked the entrances. 
So um, there's both pinch points and reason to congregate in those um, smaller parks. We have some very, very small uh, gated off-leash areas. So those are closed effective last Friday. Um, everything else in terms of our off-leash inventory has been converted to on-leash. Um, thinking behind that is that we'll, we'll minimize the interactions of, uh, of people and dogs and, their, and therefore people and people as well. So we're asking that people keep their animals on leash, that they're under control, and that they're maintaining social and physical distance from one another. Um, we've also increased our enforcement and education uh, across the valley system. Um, over the weekend, we, we were out in force. We talked to a lot of people, educated a lot of people. Um, but for the most part, uh, upwards of 60 to 70 percent compliance. And that's kind of two days out of the gate. So we'll continue to have a presence on social media and in the media in general. Uh, and also have physical presence on those sites where we're, we're actively asking people to be on leash now. Okay, thanks, Travis. Uh, Dave, anything else unique in terms of dog parks, what you're thinking of doing, what you're doing? Not really. Uh, we've got one small fenced-in uh, dog park, and it is closed because people tend to sit on the benches and tables and let their dogs play, so that, that is closed uh, because physical distancing there isn't, uh, isn't going to be possible. The other off-leash parks are open and uh, they're basically walking trails in big areas. So people are using them, but. Maybe this would be a good time, Dave, to talk to, about what you're doing with garbage cans. Yeah, sure. Um, so when we closed the playgrounds, we realized that, well, garbage cans is a place where people touch and we want people to keep using the garbage cans. Otherwise they just throw litter on the ground and not pick up after their dogs. So we came up with a way to uh, prop the lids of the hollow garbage cans open. Um, and that was a pretty simple fix. It takes a little bit to put in, but uh, the prototype basically is a couple of bolts. Looks, looks like that, if you can see. Um, just a couple of bolts uh, partway down the, um, part way down the, um, the lid so that the lid stays open six, seven, eight inches. Uh, yesterday, Halal let me know that they are working on a, on a wedge that uh, goes in real quick and they've just delivered the prototype now. So we're continuing to prop open the lids with our bolts, but um, as soon as they get us the supply and they are making them quick. So if anybody else wants them, uh, contact Halal and uh, you'll be able to prop the uh, lids of your garbage cans open. The other garbage cans that aren't Halal, it's easy enough to uh, open the flap so that people don't have to touch anything to use the garbage cans. Hopefully that's going to save us picking up a lot of litter and keep our parks cleaner. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. Trevor, anything else that hasn't been said what Red Deer is doing with uh, dog parks? Uh, so certainly not for dog parks. Uh, for us, it, it really is a case of uh, trying to encourage appropriate use instead of stopping the use at this point in time. But uh, to say that decisions change every day here with our emergency operations center. So we're being flexible and nimble as those decisions change. Red Deer's in a great position with our garbages because they're the open top style garbages that no one has to touch to use. So we're not probably faced with the same challenge that uh, Lethbridge is. Our only problem is really related to the weight of the garbages and having two staff sometimes required to handle those and making sure those two staff are safe as they're handling the garbage itself. Perfect. Oops. Oh, sorry, I lost my, my uh, Zoom meeting for a sec there. So thank you on that. So another um, important one that's come up is, uh, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna skip this one. I'm gonna go to employee protocols for safety and interactions first, because I think that one was quite popular. So obviously oh &S rules um, are interesting in these times. Uh, so questions around transportation, around staff meetings, around um, overseeing park contractors, um, distancing between staff and users. Um, so maybe, tr uh, I know you just spoke, Trevor, but let's start with you in terms of some of that stuff. Yeah, so right now we've had uh, an interesting couple of weeks, obviously. Uh, what we're really focused on is staff to staff interactions, trying to minimize that wherever possible. And our organization does usually run with two staff per vehicle. So how we've been uh, planning our redeployment of fleet resources and staffing resources getting into the summer is really uh, about minimizing the likelihood of having two staff in one truck or in one ATV at the same time. 
Uh, we we're looking right now at actually doing a multi shift per day schedule to try to address that. So basically running a morning and a night shift, uh, duplicating the use of our fleet, but allowing each person to just drive one unit. We also are looking at masks for our staff where we are requiring them or asking them to get into a vehicle with somebody else uh, where we just have no other alternatives. We're looking at opportunities for masks, especially after the announcement from the province last night. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, Travis, in terms of employee protocols, safety? Yeah. And so we've done a few things. Um, staggered start times across the operation uh, we put into play. So just separating um, larger crews by Time, 15 minutes is usually good enough to get people in and out, ready for the day and out of the yard. Um, we've increased our cleaning frequency in all of our kind of mess areas. So in our, our lunch rooms or meeting areas, um, we've added contract services to disinfect three times a day. We've uh, brought on additional le lease trucks so that we have all our employees down to um, one per truck right now. There's some cases where that's not perfectly feasible, like uh, with your um, aerial bucket trucks, but we are working on uh, keeping them one to a truck. And then um, we've developed with our oh &S team a, a big comprehensive um, hazard assessment and control uh, for our operations teams. And everyone's kind of come through in the last week or so and um, signed off on it. So everything from how to keep the appropriate distance from your coworkers right down to, you know, 20 seconds hand wash and making sure that they're going through and watching that video. Something that we could probably share um, to ARPA if, uh, if desired. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, we will take any and all resources right now. So, uh, Dave? Uh, nothing really new to add, except for we are talking about uh, bringing seasonal workers back on in a, in a few weeks and whether or not they need to uh, come into lockers and washrooms at the start of their shift or should they show up for work dressed and ready to go out to the field. Uh, the other thing we started to talk around a little bit is instead of having them report to a depot, just having them report to uh, a park or a work site so they can go straight and use their own vehicle and pay the mileage so we don't have to transport them. And that's uh, about the same as everybody. Okay, thanks, Dave. There was a question on dog parks uh, in our from Brett in Strathcona County. So I wanna get to that, maybe let one of you guys answer it. So with any dog parks that municipalities have left open, have you noticed other impacts? So uh, overflow parking lots, traffic, um, the fact that most dog parks require travel, so you're, you may be promoting carpooling, bottlenecking, those types of things. Any, any, uh, anybody want to answer the parking lot query? Okay, Trevor. So for us, this is definitely one of the big concerns and one of the driving forces why we're actually looking at uh, potentially closing some of our off-leash parks. Um, we've heard rumor that some other municipalities have been barricading every second stall through their parks themselves to maintain a physical distancing. We haven't done that yet, but we're definitely looking at what our options are. We have two off-leash parks that are both huge with quite small parking lots. So we recognize those, those pinch points as being the parking lots and the key entrance points. Uh, and yeah, we're curious as to anyone else as to whether they've taken measures uh, to close off or to limit the number of parking stalls in their areas. Perfect. Anybody else? Dave, Travis? Yeah, it's, I would just going to add uh, by pushing our off leash to on leash it's kind of um i think it's recalibrated the inventory of parks that are available for dog walkers so even though we only have a handful of uh, off leash parks we have hundreds and hundreds of on leash parks so we're hoping that that uh, works to redistribute um, dog walkers across the city and maybe close to their homes in their neighborhoods and and uh, discourages them from kind of congregating in their traditional um, off leash commute areas Thanks. All right, so I'm going to go on to the next um, question I, or topic I had, which was more to do with service levels. So I guess I, is mine says during and after COVID. I guess we don't know the answers really to after COVID, but what, what are you changing in terms of your service levels? How do you plan to maintain assets um, without damaging by reducing service levels too low? Um, Dave, I'll start with you because I know, um, again, I saw a note in yours that, that you pushed for maintaining service levels just so that parks looked nice and stuff like that. So, and we're safe. Well, we're, we're preparing for parks to be busier than normal through the year. And if that's the case, they need to be functional and safe and accessible for people. So our, our first plan is to continue uh, as business as normal as, as we can, but recognizing that we're going to have to shift. Um, 
And so we've got kind of a sliding scale of services that we'll cut back on as, uh, as we need to. So obviously sports fields, that's, that's easy, they're closed. Um, and other things that are, that are closed, playgrounds are closed. But um, if we can um, adjust our service level as our staffing resources are adjusted for us, um, we'll, we'll continue that way. We've also identified the core services. So what's it gonna take to protect our living assets? And we, we've got a core staffing level that is needed for that. So right now we're, we're planning on change and being flexible. Okay, uh, Trevor? I, I would say we're quite consistent with what Dave's doing. We're really focused on uh, ensuring that we won't have major costs of reclamation after the summer. So when it comes to things like turf maintenance, even sports field maintenance, we're wanting to ensure that uh, we're maintaining a reasonable level of service to sustain that infrastructure. Uh, the other big thing for us where we're really um, going to be taxed is trying to manage with uh, the one staff per fleet unit. We just recognize we won't be able to get the same amount of work done through the city. And we're also anticipating major changes to how we uh, sanitize washrooms if we do reopen washrooms into the summer, uh, how we sanitize the playgrounds and allocating appropriate resources to some of those new emergent uh, works that we need. Um, and all of this is being paired back with the reality that our organizations are searching for money and parks always ends up being the, the first place they look where, uh, where they look at reducing expenses. So I know we've been working on cost savings initiatives through the city of Red Deer uh, on a regular basis over the last two weeks. And we're crossing our fingers that not too many of them get adopted. Okay, thanks Trevor. Travis? Yeah, roughly the same. Uh, to date, we don't have um, an overarching uh, strategy on service levels, but we've looked at um, potentially pairing back some of the uh, non-essential, the nice to have. So um, reducing mowing cycles, uh, looking at um, trimming and whether that's a fundamental piece um, looking at uh, shrub bed maintenance and whether we can um, prolong our cycles there. Um, and, and just seeing on the outside the core of keeping the assets in a, in a somewhat um, approachable condition, are there, are there cost savings that we can um, uh, harvest for the corporation during a difficult time? All right, uh, thanks. I see, uh, so this was uh, an, uh, one of my ones coming up, but, uh, and I don't know if any of you guys will be in the position to answer this, but. Our municipality manages and operates nine campgrounds. Can anyone share how they're handling campgrounds? A bit early yet, but I know it. So it was on my, I'm gonna, I can skip down uh, two here uh, question. Well, only one question, so our topics. So yeah, my question it relates to this, what happens when the snow melts? I know Dave's snow is gone, but uh, uh, sports fields, how are you gonna keep people off sports fields? Campgrounds, are they, I know I saw an article on the news last night, a uh, uh, campground in Cochrane, uh, it's a private campground, but a lot of snowbirds live there during the their non-snow uh, bird travel times. They 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 need the the campground, so they were self they were open. They were putting new protocols in place uh, to keep people separated. They were uh, coming and visiting them if they needed water, so they weren't using they couldn't use those quarantine people couldn't use their washrooms and stuff like that. So I guess campgrounds included that. Uh, you know, there were some questions about spray parks, obviously with the summer coming up, boat launches community gardens. So I know a lot there, but anybody on this panel know about campgrounds and do you have any campgrounds? Okay, Trevor. Yeah, so uh, the city has two campgrounds within our city limits. One of them is a private, semi-privately owned and maintained campground, and they're going to remain operational. Um, the city owned and operated uh, campground is a contract operation, and we've actually delayed the opening of that until June 30th, along with all of our rec facilities just to uh, try and be consistent with what we're doing with the rec facilities and the park facilities. So we're delaying the opening uh, and that again could be extended all the way through the summer depending on what happens with the province. Okay, thanks. Uh, Travis or Dave, do you guys have campgrounds? No, okay. What about, uh, what about, uh, it, this came up just more uh, in, in a conversation with our staff the other day, but how are you guys gonna keep people off sports fields? Cause you know, I know there's not gonna be any organized sport, but it could be ad hoc sport. I know I'm a soccer player and I'm dying to play soccer again. So how are you going to, how do you think that's going to work? Uh, Dave, any thoughts there? You know, all, all of the organized bookings for our, our facilities or sports fields and stuff have been formally canceled. So those won't be happening. But as far as ad hoc use and groups showing up, um, 
I, I think it's just roving patrols of our bylaw officers and animal control officers and uh, letting people know to, to stay away. Travis yeah. is just going to let the lawn grow really long. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. We're going to four feet. No, just kidding. <laughs> We're trying not to do that. Um, but we don't have decisions. We're waiting for our major uh, user associations to, uh, to hold some meetings and, and get back to the city. So we're going to make that decision in a week or two, but I, I agree with Dave. It's probably a bit of education and a bit of uh, enforcement. Um, so I don't know. We're, we've yet to cross that bridge. Yeah. Uh, what, okay. What about uh, on my list here? Community gardens. Anybody thinking about their community gardens and what's going to happen there? Trevor, maybe start with you. Yeah, so uh, community gardens are probably the most controversial thing that we've been going through in the last week here. So we have officially closed and canceled our community garden program for the year. Uh, the reasoning being we wanted to be consistent with our rec facilities that are closed until at least June 30th. But that said, uh, there's been some significant public pushback on gardens. Obviously, there is an ability for people to garden uh, in a, a safe way. Uh, however, we're worried about the parking lot congregations and things like that. So as of right now, our gardens are closed, but uh, the province of BC just made an announcement on April 3rd that they view community gardens as an essential service. And that decision is spurring on some more conversation at our council and EOC level. So we could be reversing that decision in the future. Okay, Travis, any, any decisions on yeah, community we've, gardens? Um, we're making that decision in the next uh, day or two here in Edmonton. Um, and as Trevor was referring to, we caught wind of the essential service definition out of BC as well. Um, you know, that said, we're, we're going to need to kind of redesign the way people approach those gardens um, to ensure that they have physical distancing, to ensure that we're able to provide uh, adequate oversight. We have upwards of 100 community gardens in Edmonton. Um, we want to make sure that we're not doing exactly what Trevor was warning about, having people congregate in parking lots and having people um, visiting each other at their garden beds. So we're looking at um, some potential alternative models, uh, potentially um, creating some standalone uh, temporary beds that have the appropriate distance for folks. But um, right now, no decisions have been made. We're, we're talking it through. Okay. Dave, anything to add there? Uh, the city doesn't directly operate any community gardens. Those are all operated by community associations and, uh, and, and groups that, that run them individually. So it's going to be up to them to determine procedures for uh, keeping people distant if they open. Okay. Um, a question came in on the side here. So golf courses. Uh, I know the city of Edmonton, the city of Lethbridge has golf courses. I don't know, our city of Red Deer, I don't know about Lethbridge, but uh, what's, what's the golf course situation in Travis? Yeah, they're in the final uh, stages of um, picking service levels. They're um, defining their golf greens as, a, as an asset um, of significant value, so something that a, a course service, service should continue on. Um, they're still in the final stages of figuring out uh, how, how or if to, to open them to the public, uh, and they're talking about how they maintain everything outside of the, um, the greens, whether they reduce service level on the, the fairways and the rough. Um, so, so more to come on that, but uh, it looks like they're, they're trying to at least retain service levels to keep their greens in a, in a good condition. Okay, thanks. Uh, Trevor? Yeah, so at our municipal golf course uh, right now, we don't have a confirmed plan in place as to whether we're going to open or close that facility. But similar to what Edmonton's talking about, we still would be requiring a minimum level of service to be provided, which would be to maintain the greens, maintain the fairways and the tee boxes, just to make sure that uh, we could reopen the golf course uh, when, when the time comes. Um, but as of right now, haven't actually decided whether that's an amenity that will open in a different way or whether we'll uh, have it non-operational for the summer. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll throw it out there. I, I think I know the answer, but what about spray parks? Probably, I'm assuming, uh, delay, 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 but uh, any thoughts there? Spray parks. Up in Edmonton, uh, delayed. We're not firing them up until further notice. Okay, that's what I figured. Um, all right, so uh, it was mentioned, I think Trevor had mentioned this, but what about uh, some questions about cleaning and disinfecting advice on amenities? So what kind of amenities, what does the, what does cleaning and disinfecting look like? Playground inspections, cleaning the, the playground equipment. Um, Trevor, start with you maybe. 
So uh, the CPSI, actually, the Canadian Playground Safety Institute, had actually released some information on appropriate sanitization techniques and also concerns with using some different types of chemicals on playgrounds. So I'd encourage anyone who's interested to just go on the CPSI website and uh, look at that. For us, we are right now considering just water pressure washing those playgrounds a few days before we reactivate and open them. And then just let, uh, let solar, which is an amazing sterilant itself, uh, do its thing. So with them not being used, hope, we're hoping for a good weather event before July 1st and uh, letting Mother Nature do what it does best. Hey, Travis, what about uh, any amenities? Uh, are you thinking about clean, uh, cleaning off park benches, uh, anything else? So, so the one amenity we're highly focused on right now are our washrooms. Um, so as I was referring to in our, in our staffing areas, uh, in our buildings, we've increased uh, service levels through contract cleaning. Um, but we've also done that across our uh, citywide inventory of washrooms. So we've uh, increased service there to up to nine times a day in some locations. Um, and in combination with that, we're monitoring the usage of those washrooms because that's one of those, uh, you know, really high touch points. And given the volumes of people we've seen in a number of our parks, we feel that's, that's pretty prudent to get after. At this point, uh, play spaces are closed. Um, we are talking about uh, still doing some some minimum inspection to make sure the infrastructure is not literally falling falling apart. But uh, as of now, they're they're all closed. Um, we haven't had that discussion around the, the park's benches um, as of yet, but definitely something we should be considering. Okay, thanks, uh, Dave. Anything to add on on cleaning? Not not really. I mean, we'll look at water or we'll look at um, playgrounds before we open them, and it may be a simple matter of leaving them unused for four days kind of thing and uh, and cleaning them up after that. Washrooms is definitely something we're going to have to look at like Edmonton to uh, to make sure if and when we open them that we they can be done safely. Okay. Um, so move on to the urban forest, uh, tree care, maintenance. We know that uh, our, our forests, urban forests are huge assets for the community. So are there any uh, changes, adaptions you're making in terms of looking after your urban forest? Uh, Dave, I know you just talked, but we'll start with you. Uh, well, that's one of the areas that uh, we feel it's important to continue a, a basic level of service, um, just so that we don't have pests moving in and, or trees that are stressed and, and amenable to, to pests moving in. So that is one area that we're gonna continue on uh, service level as usual. Okay, and, uh, Trevor. And, and we're figuring out how to social distance our crews. Sure. Uh, yeah, so we're very similar to Lethbridge and we view our tree care program as an essential service. So where we may uh, cut back a little bit on say tree planting initiatives or something like that, our uh, aerial bucket truck crews, all of our operations around trees at this point in time, we're planning on not impacting that through the COVID crisis and just uh, working with our foremen to schedule their crews appropriately and make sure that they have all the tools they need. Okay, Travis? Yeah, we run a year-round um, forestry operation, so they continue to operate uh, today. Um, and we've proposed, uh, similar to the others, that they're, they're kind of a tier one service. So essential in a lot of ways, in particular during um, storm events, but also um, during doing block pruning just to mitigate uh, potential hazards in our residential neighborhoods. So at this point, we've proposed to keep the, the service um, consistent in terms of our pruning. We are uh, similar to Trevor. I think they're looking at uh, the planting program and seeing if there's some potential cost savings in that area. Um, but we're, we're pending decisions uh, in the next week or so on uh, finalized service levels. Okay, thanks, Travis. Um, we're actually doing fairly well. I still have a bunch of topics to go through, but we, I just wanted to remind people we have about 10 minutes left. Um, so if, if you have a, uh, a question that you would like the panel to answer, um, please fire it up into that Q&A um, pod that we have going and, and we'll try and get it answered. But uh, I'm going to continue on here with some topics. So I know a big one and it's just uh, timing wise coming up right away on us here is what about the construction season? So we saw in the NRPA poll, about deferring capital um, projects and stuff like that. Um, Travis, do you know what's going on with construction season, what your plans are? We've, um, we've been connecting with our infrastructure construction teams over the last week or so. Um, I think every area of the city of Edmonton is, is looking at um, dialing back services for the uh, sake of leaving some money on the table. 
Um, but but as of now, it, it appears uh, that some of those, the majority of those construction projects are continuing to proceed. Um, we are pending decisions again, uh, I think on the 15th, in terms of an overall citywide strategy of cost reductions and savings. Um, but as of now, um, many of our construction projects are, are on track, neighborhood renewal or, or new park construction. Okay, uh, Dave? No, nope, pretty much the same. We're continuing on um, doing things like uh, online meetings for pre-construction meetings and things like that. Obviously practicing social distancing or physical distancing when we're on site and leaving it up to contractors to uh, make sure they work safely. Okay, uh, Trevor? Uh, very similar to the rest of the group uh, from a construction perspective uh, the economy has probably been the biggest impact on slowing our construction over anything else so our capital project list for new park development in red year was pretty light already and we might pair that back just a little bit further this year but generally anything that's still in our capital budget is pretty highly essential so uh, anything that's there we're still planning to move forward with okay, thanks uh, there's been a couple questions come in and one was actually my ne next topic was around pest management uh, planning so Somebody's asked about noxious weed control service levels, and and uh, I guess that relates to obviously what else? What what's your overall pest management plan going to be, uh, Trevor? Maybe start with you. Yeah, so for pest management, we'll be similar to previous years. We'll probably be paring back a little bit on uh, noxious weed control, Canada thistle primarily, and focusing uh, as much as we can on prohibited noxious species, and then on any of our other major pests. Um, but generally, I'd say slight pare back in service, but not anything significant. Right here. Okay, thanks, Travis. Yeah, uh, much the same up in Edmonton. We've proposed that uh, that regulated weeds still need to be serviced, um, and not you can't take your foot off the gas with this type of stuff, um, even from a functional perspective. But definitely to meet uh, regulatory uh, law. Okay, thanks, Dave. Anything to add? That's one of the criteria we used when we were determining which services were essential and more important and less important is if it's going to cost us more next year. Um, be, if we don't do it this year, then it's more important to do it this year. So weeds, if they grow and it doubles the amount of work next year, we haven't saved anything. We've actually increased work next year. And uh, so we're like the others, we're going to continue on as best we can. Awesome. Thank you. So another question, I know some of you guys have outdoor pools. So Natasha from Castor is asking about how do they, how, what, how they should prepare best for their outdoor pool season. Are you guys cleaning and prepping your pools? Are you concerned about having the pool ready for when it may be time to open? Uh, any plans with your outdoor pool? So uh, Travis? Sorry, I don't, I don't have a response to this one. Uh, <laughs> Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, no worries. Direct partners. I'll ask it and see if I can get it. Sure, Ned, always Trevor. Any, do you have any information on that? Yeah, so uh, in our conversations with our recreation department, um, right now they are planning for a July 1st opening of our outdoor pool along with the indoor. Um, but that being said, uh, they've been doing shutdown work right now at, with their indoor facilities and likely they would start operationalizing this in June 1st. So we'll just deal with that as it comes up and where we're at by June 1st ultimately. Perfect. Um, I'm going to open it up. I have some other little ones here, but I'm going to open up the panel. Any any topics you were hoping that we would talk about that we haven't yet? There's all silence. Well, okay. I'll, I'll start off. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's it's hard to uh, plan a, for a season where our parks are either going to be busier than normal or they're going to be empty, and. You know, neither one of those is under our control. But one one way we're approaching this is realizing that people are stressed, they're anxious, they're shut in, and parks can provide a valuable service to the community and, and affect their social and emotional well-being and their basically the psyche of the whole community. So we are going to do our best to maintain uh, a consistent level of service so that uh, parks can actually be a respite as long as they're able. Uh, when people can no longer use the parks, well, we can no longer maintain them. So that's an easy decision. But in the meantime, uh, we're seeing this as a community service and people's social and emotional well-being is part of emergency planning. And uh, we're, we're going to do our best to be part of the solution. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. We have a few questions that are trickling in here. So um, what about tennis courts and pickleball courts? Anybody want to take tackle that one? 
So from Red Deer, uh, we, we are, everything is closed and will remain closed right now until uh, June 30th. Uh, that's for both pickleball and basketball courts, tennis courts, any of our asphalt pads at all through the city. We've got signs up on them now that say they're closed and in all fairness, our ring boards are still up surrounding most of them. So uh, we're not going to be pulling those down anytime soon. Thanks. Um, what about irrigation systems? Are you, are you going to turn those on, activate them? Travis? Yeah, yeah, we, we've we um, said that aligns kind of with the, the golf course uh, greens discussion as well as our premier field discussion. Um, so we want to be really careful about service levels um, across the board for, for our sports fields inventory because eventually they're coming back online and we don't want to be in a circumstance where we need to rebuild those, those premiers. Um, so that's something that we're pushing very hard for. Um, that we continue a pretty pretty high level of service so that they're ready for play when that when that day returns. Thanks, Travis. Does any, do any of you deal with uh, river access boat launches, lake access? Yeah, we we do up in Edmonton. So we're still still pending decisions there. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty late spring up here. I don't know if folks know. There's still like three feet of snow on the ground. Maybe that's a good thing this season. Yeah. Um, so we'll make that call in the next couple of weeks, but we do have a lot of river access uh, points uh, across the river valley. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to my, thanks for the questions, everybody. Uh, one, one that came up or a couple that came up, uh, just, uh, we have a few minutes left here. So one was uh, homelessness camps. Uh, we talked about this at the parks forum. I know we had a great session on about it. Has anything changed in terms of how you're going to approach homeless camps um, during COVID? Uh, Trevor, let me start with you. Yeah, so we've had some pretty significant changes in the last couple of weeks. Um, we've always taken the stance that if our shelter system or our alternative housing options uh, dry out, uh, that we would reduce the amount of uh, camp removal and cleanup that we would do. So with COVID, our shelter spaces had to spread themselves out, which means they had a lower capacity. So for the last two weeks, we have uh, only been doing essential camp cleanups. That's camp cleanups that are right next to a playground. Uh, and we're interested to see what happens. We've just got a new shelter space opening in the city, and that probably will spur on a discussion about us reinstituting that level of service. But for right now, we're pretty heavily reduced on that service level. Hey, Travis? It's much the, much the same up in Edmonton um, to accommodate the social distances required at, um, at our outreach areas. We, um, we closed camp cleaning for several weeks. Um, there's still quite a bit of work to be done, but at this point we're um, mostly entering camps that have either been abandoned or people who have been uh, relocated. So we're not kind of issuing evictions or, or setting time for moving on because we think it's important to keep people in place and keep those distances um, wherever they are. Uh, trying try not to push them into um, group facilities. Uh, we also opened the, um, the Northlands Convention Center uh, to handle handle folks, homeless folks who uh, who need supports. Um, in particular, there's an area there for for self isolation as well. And we're add, adding different types of capacity, including um, uh, you know showering areas as well. Okay, thanks, Travis. Um, another question came in, and I think that this one might be a good one to to uh, to have uh, for the next. Um, webinar on park operations, because I think that's where we're, we're, our heads are going to have to start going. But the question from Justin, I'm assuming it's Justin else, but in anticipation of higher levels of use pending relaxation of physical distancing, as well as the likely greater local tourism promotion of our parks, as the economy begins to rebound, what strategies are in the mix to manage visitors? So I think that that's a real concern, especially even on the recreation side we have, is that maybe when it's time to bounce back, people are like really gung-ho to get get back into the systems and maybe we'll be overwhelmed. Um, anybody want to touch on that? We have a couple minutes. Anybody want to touch on, on if you're thinking that far ahead yet? Well, I think one of the reasons we're looking at service levels is that, uh, so that when things do rebound, we don't have to start from scratch. So, um, you know, our turf is healthy and ready to go um, and things are ready when, uh, when this is over. Okay. Perfect. Um, we got one minute left. The only other one I have on my list here that I don't think we've talked about is cemeteries. So any different protocols for cemeteries in your plans or are they, are, are they running the same as, as other park protocols? So for Red Deer, uh, we have actually changed how we sell and, uh, and select lots where uh, we don't have staff face-to-face -face, uh, interactions with people anymore. 
So a lot of virtual meetings uh, with our key cemetery sales staff. And then when it comes time for a service, um, our staff are using some really strong social distancing rules. Originally, we were seeing large, large funerals being held outdoors because people viewed that as being safer. However, uh, in the last week or two, we've seen a major change in that where it's just small services being held. Um, multicultural burials are definitely a problem for us because those require a little bit more direct connection. And so we've been equipping our staff with uh, different types of PPE to make sure that they're safe in those situations. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Tra Trevor. So we have reached uh, the noon time period. So um, we ripped through a lot of uh, stuff. Um, so hopefully people will uh, be able to access the recording if they need to rewatch or if they took good notes during. So I want to thank uh, David, uh, Trevor, Travis, and Catherine. I saw Catherine uh, populating the, the comments from Calgary in the system. So thanks for doing that, Catherine. One comment that Catherine did make that, that Heather Cowie asked, which is, is a cool thing, is opening up road systems um, to, to uh, the public uh, to spread out um, you know, those pinch points, I guess, in terms of, of that social, the physical distancing and still getting out to exercise. So that's something that Calgary started to do, which is, is kind of cool and unique as well. So. Um, I, I'm going to connect with these panel panel uh, folks and, and others maybe, and we'll look to do another one in a couple weeks. I think the world will be a little bit different in a couple weeks in terms of, uh, of uh, we're, we're closer to our, our spring and summer period. There may be more protocols in place with park operations that have effect. So um, I thank everybody. Um, thanks for the participants. We didn't really drop much. That was good. We still have 70 people. So we kept people around for the whole hour. So uh, Thanks, and we'll let you go have lunch. And um, yeah, we'll sh we'll share this recording and a bunch of other stuff when we have it available.